US real estate nurturing young leaders uh, webinar series on COVID-19 impact on real estate. Uh, today, team will be on residential developments. Uh, we are pleased and, and honored to have uh, three of our alumni, uh, who's uh, Adrian Lim, Anthony Chua, and Lin Nijia, to join us uh, and to share with us their experience uh, in, in, in managing these residential uh, uh, developments during this COVID-19 uh, period. So, um, Adrian Lim, uh, first speaker, I think, uh, he, he actually graduated at the same time as me, my classmate. Uh, he joined Fragrance uh, Group Limited since 2011. He had been involved uh, actively in the acquisition and development. Some of the projects like Park Rosewood, Urban Vista, Novena Regency and Kensington Square. Uh, before joining Fragrance Group, Adrian spent about 17 years with the Urban Redevelopment Authority uh, in, in the Development Control Group. Some of the project uh, he has handled include uh, Vivo City, RW, uh, Resort World Singapore, Reflection at Capital Base, and Interlace, as, and, and etc. So uh, that's Adrian. Uh, our second speaker is Anthony Chua. Uh, Anthony Chua is currently the Deputy GM at Capital Corporation Limited. Uh, he has 25 years experience in real estate practices. Uh. Uh, in business development valuation investment broker. He started off at, uh, with, at CBIE uh, as a consultancy investment function and subsequently he had joined uh, City Developments uh, handling their investment acquisition across different countries like Singapore, China, Southeast Asia and, and, and as far as Moscow. He structured and negotiated acquisition and investment uh, of, of a various type of property development including large integrated mixed project, transport-oriented development, and so on. Uh, he then moved, after CDR, he moved to an expanded role uh, 11 years later in United Industry Corporation, UIC, and head the business development and marketing division, uh, where he oversees acquisition, sales, marketing for over 2,000 uh, units of commercial space in Singapore. Right. In 2014, he joined Capital Land, National part of the Capital Corporation conglomerate to head the business development and asset management function in Singapore of the Singapore Union. Right. Taken interest in global economics and social uh, geopolitical kind of trends. Uh, right. And then the third speaker is actually uh, uh, Dr. Lee Niger. I think uh, he's currently uh, Deputy Director at the Institute of Real Estate and Urban Study uh, prior to uh, returning to the academy, he actually headed the uh, research development in Knife Frank Singapore and Edmund Tai Company. He led the department in producing quality market intelligence to regular research and report commentary, media columns. I think many of you have seen him in, in interview uh, here and so on. Uh, Niger, before joining, before uh, starting his career in the industry, he was actually an assistant professor at NUS, a colleague from the Department of Real Estate. He actually uh, graduated from MIT with a PhD in urban and regional planning. And as I said before, he joined the industry. He was an assistant professor at the Department of Real Estate. Okay, welcome to uh, our panelists today. Uh, today's session, as mentioned, is actually on the residential developments. Uh, our format is actually, uh, we, we will ask the three panelists to share uh, their experience in the recent pandemics and how they actually uh, manage these pandemics and how they actually overcome some of these problems, especially in the residential demand area. So, uh, with, without any uh, particular orders, maybe I should invite Adrian uh, to start first to tell us a little bit how you know uh, this pandemic has exposed some of the weaknesses, some of the challenges facing the real estate development industry. Adrian, you would like to serve us? Hi. Uh, thanks, thanks, uh, Tempo, for, for the invitation. And uh, I I'm just want to qualify myself. I, I suppose, critically, I'm trying to share this primarily for uh, the graduating students or the undergrads, uh, because some of this information may be, what would you call, uh, already known by the industry. So, so just giving you a bit of a background so that uh, we can put things in context. I, I suppose with the COVID situation, in, in I think 
in 48 hours, we were instructed by URA to, to shut down our, our show flat. And that caught a lot of us by surprise. Uh, and and uh, of course, our agents were all in panic mode, trying to close deals. Uh, our contractors were, were also asked to stop work and things like that. So um, what was a disruption for us was uh, to get ourselves ready digitally. Uh, uh, to, to continue to market and sell our properties. Uh, but just to share with you, uh, we, we do have projects in Australia and we, we do uh, have projects in Melbourne and in Perth. Uh, the one in Melbourne is about 800 units and almost 80% of our buyers are actually overseas. So they're not sold to locals. So we, we have had experience selling them overseas and it is sold without um, show flat, without uh, 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 any flying of all these foreigners over to, to Australia and things like that. So it's not impossible uh, to sell your products, uh, your residential products overseas. Uh, I suppose now it makes things a lot more convenient for us if you are uh, digitally ready in the onset. So maybe I just share with you what we possibly would have done uh, and what we have already done in uh, Australia. This is uh, a Premier Tower in Melbourne. So it's right in the middle of the CBD. And at the end of the day, what we had to do was to, uh, mind you, this is five years ago technology. So oh. I, I think technology nowadays is going to be even better. Uh, yeah, I think so is this a uh, rotating uh, yeah, tower? Is, correct. Yeah. So this premier tower is is it's uh, it may stagger a bit, but it is basically an integration between aerial photography, uh, rendering done by the uh, architect, and uh, of course by by the the so called the renderer. So if you look at it, it looks almost real. And if I'm not wrong, I've seen uh, later images done by uh, other developers, it looks even better. So, so as it is, it is not impossible to integrate video um, with fly through, um, with renders that's almost real. Um, but actually all these are, as you said, five years ago. So you don't get to see uh, the real building now as it is. So this was taken when building under construction? Yeah, no, it was taken when the building oh. is still not demolished yet. Oh, so, okay. <laughs> so it's five years ago that we marketed this. Yeah. Uh, and of course, we have gone through uh, development. So what you see in the background is real aerial photography and then they integrate video with fly-throughs and things like that. I mean, it's uh, a lot costly five years ago and, and uh, what I realized is that it's a lot, lot cheaper nowadays. Lah. So, so it's not something impossible. So what we actually sold in China is to just continuously run videos, bring in what you call um, uh, travel models and, and maybe unit models at best. So there's no extensive cost in developing show flats and things like that. Oh. Um, yeah, basically uh, that's how we marketed in Australia into the rest of the world and, and as I said, uh, about a good 80% of them actually bought them without, I think only a handful flew over to Australia to see for themselves. So it's, it's not something impossible. Uh, so just moving on to our another project in Perth, um, I think what's available nowadays is not so much what you call uh, uh, using your VR goggles, but to be able to uh, be able to actually capture images of your display unit. And on top of that is to allow uh, a very easy interaction with any users, whether you're using it on your phone, on your iPad, on your computer, and, and you are able to walk through quite seamlessly over your project. Um, and, and this, uh, it's, it feels almost real. And, and I suppose um, 
the additional features that you that the users can use in this situation is to actually take measurements uh, to know exactly how tall the uh, how tall the room is and uh, uh, whether you know how wide the cabinetry is how long uh, how deep the the Uh, the cabinets are and, and, and basically go around take measurements throughout the whole building uh, to their to their liking so this basically allows what we call users interaction uh, into into uh, being able to go around the building able to uh, what would you call experience the building without actually being there so we allow them to, to go in, view day views, night views, um, experience as though they were already there. So this we hope will tip the scale to uh, get them to sign on the dotted line and more importantly, sign on the check. Uh, so <laughs> And jump into the pool as well. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I mean, there are simple things like people will be always asking how long is the pool, and they are able to measure themselves. Uh, there's there's no need for me to uh, simulate or question them or, or be able to provide such info. But it's really interactive, and I think it will only get better uh, nowadays uh, with 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 technology. So so as I said, these are rendered image uh, going back to Melbourne and uh, basically one after another you should be able to see that it is quite realistic as it is nowadays and, and it, I believe it can only get better. So that, that's about it in, in us marketing but of course these are what I call tools that we give to the agents. Uh, we still depend a lot on the agents uh, and today they are the, the one that is what will you call uh, our first contact point with the buyers. Uh, so I, I suppose given this environment, we, we are a bit more concerned over cross-border cross border laws. I mean, if you're selling in Singapore, it's totally fine. But we start selling in Australia, we start selling in uh, Australian products in in China, in Indonesia, and things like that. Uh, this COVID situation brings to mind a question of uh, authenticity. At the end of the day, we still rely on a paper contract where the contract is still physically signed. Now, the next question is, are we able to do it digitally? And whether such di digital signatures are, are uh, upheld by law and by evidence. So, so these are some of the concerns we have, but I think uh, with opening of phase two and phase three with this COVID, uh, contracts can still travel. So at the end of the day, no matter how we do it, uh, I know money can be transferred uh, digitally. Uh, our advice has been still to get a physical contract signed uh, as of now, at least as of now. Developers, um, we, we definitely have to bear the cost. Uh. This oh, okay. really um, amounts to about 1% to 2% of our total development cost as far as marketing is concerned. Okay. A, lot, a lot goes into marketing material. Um, right. A lot goes into rendering. Uh, of mm. course, producing nice fancy food brochures were a thing of the mm. past. Uh. I yeah. think nobody wants to carry a thick brochure nowadays. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> wants to be able to access their, yeah. their documents. Do you see with all these technology, uh, will your cost, you know, marketing costs actually increase or decrease? Because with the technology, you probably cut down the, the need to have more uh, personal kind of marketing, right? Yes. Do you see the cost to, to, to trade off? You know? I, I see the cost cutting both ways. Uh. I think yeah. at the end of the day, you still need to supply your agents with a good flip book, a good yeah. uh, 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 agent's manual. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. where they will then equip themselves with the knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, I unfortunately find that not everyone is as IT savvy and, and in mm -hmm. fact, as yeah. painful, you should know. Yeah. The time when we joined NUS, we were still yeah. in uh, Windows 3.1 uh, 
yeah. DOS 5.0 <laughs> and running on a 386. Uh. So, three, so <laughs> three and a half inch uh, floppy disk. Uh, uh. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> So those were the days. I think it, yeah. we've, we've come a long way, uh, yeah. but I suppose there yeah. is definitely opportunity to move ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. a substantial number yeah. of our agents are not as IT savvy as I would like right. them to right. be. Yeah. Because I'm more concerned about disruption to the agency because I see this interactive, this AR, VR uh, framework mm. actually can do a lot of this transaction uh, by, the, by the, the developer themselves, right? Yes. This thing can be done online. So you, you will this have any impact on the brokerage um, industry? No. As of now, no. In fact, uh, given the current uh, yeah. buyer's market, I think agents yeah. are having a good time now. Lah. But right. I'm not encouraging all our annual graduates to go out and become property agents. Lah. There's more to okay. life to become property agents. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. Uh, maybe we can also hear from Anthony. Anthony is also uh, now with uh, yeah. uh, Kepa. So, the, he also looking at some of the investment and investigation project in Singapore as well. Anthony, would like to. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Tian Fu. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Unique Call Kepa Urban Solutions. Essentially, we are a township master developer uh, come planner. Uh, so, it's not just physical planning, but uh, trying to tie in with uh, a digital twin and operating system uh, for data collection. Uh, so the focus of this unit is more master planning projects in bigger township. So it's not just a single block of tower or single uh, uh, office tower or condominium. Uh, mixed development, larger scale, TODs, transport oriented development, uh, combining rail, MRT, and, and so on and so forth. So. In this line, right, when, I mean, in, in this kind of focus, before COVID, we were always uh, concerned with what uh, the market needs, what is the market moving to. And this is something which I think is very worthwhile to share with the student. Uh, in, in, let's say about 10, up to about 10 years ago, or five, 10 years ago, you see most real estate, especially the, the commercial real estate, uh, has a very simple operating model. Uh, you rent out your offices or your, your, your shops, you collect a rent and then you pay off usual things, your cleaning, your services, right? So it's a very uh, simple, efficient thing. You just have to design well, build it well, know the tenant specification, know the condo buyer specification, and then that's it. You sell or you lease out and then you collect a rent or collect a price. It's very simple. We notice that more and more for all this property hardware, this hardware that we are building, uh, the new way of operating, uh, you begin to see an increasingly bigger, thicker level, layer of services. Uh, initially, these services were just property management, facility management. Now, that, that's very simple now, that's old school. So now you see you have co-living, you have co-working, you have all kinds of things. Uh, you have place making, right? Uh, I'm sure you have heard of that before. So it goes to show that in the operation of a building itself or a township itself, it is not so simple as just uh, being able to make sure that everything works, uh, that service had to be included inside. And this service, more than half the time, it doesn't come from uh, the property domain. And our collaborating partners, you see, are uh, usually also not from our field. Although they always need a kind of a input from us to see how to adapt their kind of technology, their kind of solutions. So whether, I mean, for, for our kind of projects, whether is it for sustainability, whether is it for mobility, whether it's about connectivity, uh, and, and connectivity is not just physical connectivity, but uh, 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 digital connectivity, and also for data collection. Right? So this is one angle we look at things. So we begin to form an opinion, and then came COVID. So how did COVID change all this? So uh, we, we, in the past, we know this whole thing about uh, decentralized working, about uh, working from anywhere and everywhere. Uh, we know that working from home was something quite aspired by many. Uh, and we all know that working from home during COVID has expedited this whole thing. But in the past, when you look at it, we look at it through rather tinted glasses, rather romanticized kind of uh, uh, views that, you know, you find yourself uh, doing things at a flexible pace, you can tend to the kids, you can go nearby for a cafe. Uh, but it turns out to be more than that, uh, obviously, because it was a compressed, uh, situation where everybody has to work from home. So 
the first thing that struck us is, oh, is a home big enough? Is a home big enough for, for, for this kind of uh, operations where a couple, let's say they got two school going children doing home based learning, all right, uh, and, and all, all four will be squeezed in their uh, condos that we're building nowadays, as you know, are getting smaller. So, squeeze inside a smaller space, all right? So, we can think so, what will the trend be in the future? And you know, how will things move? How will things change? Uh, and then, can you look at this independently without other activities and without the office element? Uh, the other related activities is then, you know, what, what, how big should a home be? What would people like change because they got kids coming in from school in the longer term, right? So people conduct a survey. I'm sure you would have heard of and read about many surveys conducted worldwide across different cultures, different geographies. But one thing is clear. Almost every survey will tell you that uh, a large proportion of people will want to continue working from home. Not all the time, half, at least half the time or more than half the time. So that makes the constitution even more, com more complex, more difficult. If, if you're either in or out, one way or the other, it's easier for people to plan, uh, but it is not. So, um, although this session is more about residential, um, when we were looking at the residential part, it became a bit difficult not to think about the impact on, on the office space. So, is a worker working from home or from the office? Uh, so, then you begin to have concepts, you hear about concepts like a hub and smoke thing where your CBD office becomes a, a, a smaller space and then your office, let's say in a uh, Tampines Regional Center or your Jurong Regional Center, uh, the new CBD that we're building, you know, uh, maybe people start to have uh, satellite office space in, in those places. And then what happens, you know? Uh, then what about near school? So if people work from home in the longer term, even after COVID, right, uh, then maybe you need to have more socialization space for uh, people in a company, uh, but they are not doing it at the workplace. They are doing it at other nodes, other communication nodes, commuting nodes, near MRT stations, near schools, near cafes, malls, or even uh, nursing homes where they juggle between uh, visiting elders in nursing home, attending to the kids in school, and then in between, rather than go back to the office, then they, they meet at the cafe. Uh, so how will co-working space be different in uh, in future, right? They, they will not all need to be in the CBD as well. Can they uh, supply this uh, hub and spoke uh, need of uh, most businesses? And how will businesses look at things? Businesses will uh, therefore look at, they have a limited office expenditure for the X amount of space that they need. Now they need to, on the one hand, they, they know they want to downsize, they, they need to put people further apart for social distancing. So how much can people really afford to pay other than utilities, grants, or allowance at home for uh, aircon and so on, and, 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 and internet uh, line. So what else do you need? Uh, can they afford the bigger space? Obviously, you cannot come up with a capex to help your employee uh, own a bigger apartment, right? But can you give a, a space grant, or let's say $400 that help the employee either in the form of rent or in his, in his mortgage payment? Let's say he used to have a mortgage payment budget of uh, $2,500. So can you give him $400 more to help him pay for a bigger space? then over time, does this become, uh, I won't call it an employee benefit, but this is a new way of, uh, you, you downsize your central office uh, expenditure, but it pass on some of it for employees to use it at home, for his home office. Then how does that affect the affordability of our condos that we're building? I mean, the, yeah, how, how much can we sell the condos for? In the old days, uh, not old days, not so old, in, in, in the past, we cannot sell uh, beyond a certain size because of affordability. And how does your clubhouse differ? How do your clubhouse, uh, what's a new clubhouse going to be like? Uh, what else do you need? Do you need a little business function room, business room in your clubhouse? Do you need a little meeting room in the clubhouse? Uh, yet the clubhouse is also supposed to supply and, and support other uh, recreation function as, as a clubhouse for dinners, for barbecues, parties, and so on. So the convertibility of clubhouse, because you know you've got only X amount of space that you can use in a clubhouse. So how do you design a clubhouse? How do you equip a clubhouse? How do you run a clubhouse? How do MCSC want to take over something which in the past was much easier, but now you've got to worry about printers in a clubhouse, you can print A3 sizes, you worry about meeting room, meeting functions, booking. In the past, where right, nobody uses a clubhouse in a day, in a weekday, daytime, or maybe some. But now there'll be a higher volume. So how do you plan that? Yeah. 
So all these became interesting things which we are still evaluating. Uh, we don't have answers yet, but it's something worth looking into. And I would say that these are some of the new impact brought about by, by COVID because people became very conscious that at any point in time, something may happen. Uh, no one envisaged COVID to be the way it was right? uh, until we, we meet it. And now I'm sure you've read of other new things, a mutated swine flu. So when's the next time there could be a COVID equivalent, 20, 30, 20, 40, nobody knows. But I think in, in a competition sphere, when we build condos, how do we want to show people that we are future-proofing the condos? Uh, we are building it that people don't have to change it again uh, in five years' time when they take delivery of the condos that they book. So these are some of the things. And then uh, in, 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 as, as a result, in our planning, whether it's sustainability, commuting, connectivity, all this comes into mind. So it is an ongo ongoing process. We are still in a set of flux. We are all uh, still trying to feel our way around. Yeah. Thanks. All right, Anthony, thanks. Um, seems like interesting that uh, there's going to be a more blur, blurring of the line between home and office. Uh, yeah, especially during this period, a lot of people working from home. Space will be a constraint. In the past, when the prices is very high, developer is trying yeah. to sell smaller unit. Now, you know, uh, having to work from home, I'm not <laughs> sure whether this is the right place. Uh, probably, Maja can tell us a little bit more. Uh, you know, it's, so uh, thanks for uh, sharing. It's interesting to look at how you know, we look at the project uh, as in township, but uh, you know, uh, services, what are amenity, more than the usual kind of property maintenance kind of services uh, required. So to, to make the uh, living more complete, the probability to enhance the quality of the living uh, within the condo and also integrate with the surrounding area. Uh, maybe you can come back again to talk a little bit more about these changes and uh, and also the other issue is a price consideration of course i mean by having more space who is going to bear the cost right and and, and, and also the challenges like co living and other kind of other form of uh, uh, development concept okay before we come back to you again and then let's uh let's just hear from niger from uh, he had been uh I mean, researching or working on the issue about technology in the, when he was at consultancy, consultancy firm, my friend and ETC have been looking at some of the technology and how widespread this technology has been embraced by the, the industry, how this has achieved and made changes some of the practices, some of the uh, processes in, in the market. Maybe Nigel, uh, let's uh, hear from you. Okay, sure. Hi. I think if we um, look on the way of technology, how technology is used, it's actually very interesting because in real estate, um, especially in Singapore, when we think about technology, we still um, are thinking about the likes of listings websites. So it's like the likes of Property Guru, 99.co type of technology companies. Um, interestingly, like VR, um, um, this VR augmented reality, they have been available um, quite, for quite some time. And in, of course, like the likes of Australia, some of them also do auctions online. So it's like a platform where the person talk about the property and then you can click on and then, you know, decide how much you want to bid. Um, in Singapore, it's a bit much more limited. Mainly you just see the prop tech world is still largely relating to that. Of course, I understand we have a prop tech session, so I won't go too much into that field. But what happened is that from the demand side, um, we find that actually what people still want is still uh, the touch and feel of the home, of the project. Um, so it's very difficult to remove that totally out of the equation uh, for most of them. Um, so because one of the reasons is that um, real estate, as everyone knows, is a, uh, is a very large quantum kind of investment. So a lot of, um, that's why a lot of buyers, they still rely a lot of advice. They, they, to them, the market is still relatively opaque, even in the case of Singapore, although information is everywhere. Um, but I think one of the biggest problems is there's too much information um, for the buyers and sellers sometimes to digest. Um, so um, just now Adrian was talking about 
you know, agents still play an important role. And, and they still play a very critical role um, today. Um, but the way the agents market, uh, as we see, also evolved over the time. Um, in the past, they were just push it out to newspaper listings. Um, they will have it, uh, maybe on put it out on property guru. But recently, we see the shift um, towards you know uh, agents trying to create their own branding uh, through writing blogs, through their Facebook, through YouTube videos. So the use of social media becomes more and more important as they try to create their own tribe of buyers. Uh, so that you know, when they when developers launch, they will bring the buyers to the to those that like the project to go there and buy. So a lot of things are actually evolving as we speak. Um, of course, e-signature uh, virtual platforms is still a bit far away. Now, on the use of virtual platforms, it's very interesting why in the past it nearly not doesn't really fly off very well. Uh, one of the reasons is that a lot of people uh, actually find that is um, how to they get seasick <laughs> seeing the, the the virtual reality because things if if your most you have motion sickness uh, and you move your eyes too fast you actually may feel dizzy um, and nauseous so that actually didn't move off very well so then we come up with uh, we see also products of augmented reality uh, that comes up where you took your iPad and then you flash, you can actually see a 3D model uh, in front of you. Um, again, um, why it doesn't really take off is also because of the rendering. Um, it's cheaper now, but it's still relatively expensive. Um, so either the, the developers have to bear the cost or the agents, um, they have to bear the cost. Um, but in this market conditions is that, you know, uh, the agents are already uh, pretty, um, you know, also not many are actually closing the deal. So it's a bit difficult. And of course, from the developer side, uh, we see that most of them, their margins are also um, thinner, uh, partly due to, you know, previously the, the land bids they bought, the land were at a quite a relatively high level. So there's very little room for them to uh, maneuver. So. In all cases, that's why we, we before COVID-19 happens, um, the technology for PropTech um, in more or less stay pretty stagnant. Now, after COVID-19, what happened is um, the, all the social distancing measures and everything that happens, you see there's a leap uh, in terms of the reception of these virtual platforms. So in the past, you know, um, most of the agents will not go through with 360 or Zoom or the use of um, videos. But now, if you talk to most of the agents, they know fairly, I would say, quite a large number. They will figure out how to do this uh, virtual um, videos. And it's quite amazing. And they even tell you how to do it with their, from their YouTube video. And they started to have like little tribes. Um, so, so, so that's what we observe, and and I think over time um, the agent's role is becoming more and more complex. Uh, probably more towards like the role of the influencer. Um, so, so that's that's what I see at least from the sales and transaction side. Um, then, of course, from real estate development side, um, I think now um, it's harder to do projections. Um, so when, when they bid for the land parcels, um, um, it's quite a tricky business. And how do we actually uh, buffer for such uncertainty? Um, in the past, the uncertainty is largely either the external shocks or you know, policy risks. Um, but besides that, now with COVID-19, suddenly I think, how much are you going to uh, give a buffer for construction risk and also for um, demand risk, I think that is also something that um, developers are very concerned with, especially if the quantum is very large. For instance, yesterday, I think two days ago, we see this launch of the Jala, Jalan Anak Bukit site, uh, the one at uh, Beauty World, opposite Beauty World. The site is quite huge and 
and the, 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 the kind of um, leads will probably be quite high in terms of the whole quantum. So in that case, um, then how are you going to plan? And, and we look at the tender process, it takes nine months, which is one of the longest I've ever seen since um, uh, the, the such, such uh, 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 GLS started. So, so it's going to be very interesting how the whole real estate development process will evolve uh, with this COVID-19 as a whole. Thanks, Aisha. Uh, I think sharing from the intermediary side of the, the, the use of technology, because I think it's important uh, to get information across, uh, especially with all these uh, technology post e-listing e and so on, uh, can help to simplify the search process and so on. Uh, uh, it's uh, interesting to, to hear uh, how technology have been useful during this pandemic period. Is any any on the downside, on any downside issue with technology? Um, do you see any limitation? You know, by having technology, you cannot fully replace the face-to-face -face and human touch. Right. Let me yeah. uh, try to make an attempt for this. Yeah. I think at the, end of, at the end of the day, yeah. I suppose critically for, for someone to be able to sell the property, uh, yeah. it's, it's a huge investment. Uh, of course, there are anecdotal examples of people buying their property online, purely online. Uh, it's, it's a big risk, uh, 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 but, but it's not impossible. As we said, uh, it's sold quite a number of units. Uh, in fact, a good proportion of them overseas without them coming over. Um, but at the end of the day, it is how convincing uh, your product is. I think it's the product differentiation that we, we have uh, and, and to be able to, to uh, substantiate that difference. Uh. So at the, at the end of the day, um, what I, I, I think as an undergraduate, your, your knowledge is critical, uh, your information uh, is critical and you need to be honest with your buyers at the end of the day. Uh. Uh, in terms of technology, it, the tools are there how you are able to, to put them together to, as, as Dr. Lee said, uh, to, to have your own branding. Uh, I know some agents have already have uh, lots of followers, as you said, uh, to be able to, to have this repeat bias coming uh, through you over and over again. Um, I think there are a lot more than just technology that you need to learn and understand. Uh, I graduated many years ago, but I thought that uh, what I realized as lacking with my constant interaction with uh, past graduates and, and developers alike is that you may need to equip yourself with uh, more knowledge on development charge. Let's put it this way, because <laughs> projects in Singapore, uh, other than the land cost, which is a huge component, your construction is your second largest component. Your third largest component uh, it is development charge. And uh, my experience with them is that a lot of them have actually got their development charge calculation wrong. Uh, their estimates uh, have gone wrong and uh, it will make or break a project. I've seen project broken uh, because as, uh, development charge was not uh, evaluated and estimated correctly. Uh, just for information, yeah. development charge is on freehold land. Uh, yeah. Leasehold land is on, on a differential premium. Um, yeah. and, and there's more to, to it la, than just yeah, it's quite a complex. Uh. Yeah, it's quite a complex thing. 1958 or 1980 or 19... <laughs> exactly, <laughs> which which exactly. baseline you, you're using, right? right. Correct. Correct. So, yeah. so, so sometimes inherent to a, a past project, a, a historical pro, a, a development, um, the development baseline is more valuable than the valuation itself. Uh, if you get the right project, uh, as we said, if you can estimate and guesstimate the baseline faster than any of your other buyers, uh, you, you, you are in good state in that sense. Yeah. yeah. 
I think we really need to strengthen, especially in the recent year, there are so many of these on-block sales. You, yes, you are difficult exactly. for you to determine where is, what is the baseline. Exactly. And, and a lot of boo-boo has been made. That's, that's, that is what I, I need to emphasize. And, and I, I okay. think it's, it's an important information. Uh, and it's not just all about zoning, plot ratio, and building height. Uh, getting approval from URA is only a first step. And that's what I realized after spending uh, 17 years in URA. Uh, there's a lot more to life after WP, mm. uh, getting a written <laughs> permission. <laughs> and then coming back to this, this yeah. story about the, the getting approval for developments, yeah, we can yeah. see that with this COVID uh, uh, pandemics, mm. we, we can see there are more and more uh, integrated projects being developed. And also they are trying to transform our current CBD from being a more, more like a monotone or mono use kind of uh, uh, area. I want to mm -hmm. bring in more residential uh, projects. Do you see the changes you know, in this uh, uh, can be done without making our development process? You know? Because our master, pro master planning process is still quite, quite uh, rigid uh, to some extent. You know? A lot of things have been well defined, well specified. If you want to go beyond or, or to make something different from what is defined by the guideline, do you see that? Uh, be, to be difficult to get the authority to to kind of support some of the idea having uh, multiple use, you know, residential, office, retail, even hotel you know, in the same building and so on. Yes, I I think it's not impossible. I in fact have a a a, a project in town where there is an incentive for us to introduce residential service apartment or hotel within our commercial building. Uh, and then there's a huge incentive of 25%. But of course, it all comes with a lot of strings attached and how you need to contribute back to uh, the, the environment at the ground floor and, and your landscape replacement. It's not impossible, but uh, I suppose it's very different from Australia. Uh, I think coming from two projects that I've done in Australia. Um, in Australia, everything is negotiated. There's, uh, in fact, when I joined uh, Fragrance and in, we were in Melbourne, uh, projects have no plot ratio. So you could build as, as high as you want. And that's why I ended up with an 80-story tower that I have in, in Melbourne. Uh, in, in Tasmania, again, plot ratio, there is a number, but it's negotiated. Uh, and, and in Perth, there is a plot ratio, but there's still a lot of 50% bonus if you do uh, what the, the town planner wants and things like that. So, so it's, it's, in Singapore, it's a lot more dictated, but I think it makes things a lot clearer for us as well. And uh, I don't see us getting uh, major stumbling blocks uh, with, with URA. I think it's more the other technical agency uh, that, that comes to mind. And therefore, that, that, brought, that brings me to the next point. I mean, uh, graduating and understanding real estate is one thing. I think you need to equip yourself with all the other technical agency work. Perhaps an integrated project with the architectural group might be useful. I, I don't know whether it's already happening now, but um, you need to understand what LTA wants. Uh, if you design for a hotel, uh, what's, the, you know, what's the sweat path of a coach? Uh, because it takes up a lot of space at your ground floor and, uh, and, and you know the substation is required at the ground floor or, or all the other technical agencies that will impact and make or break your, your development at the end of the day. Thanks. I think coming back to this, this kind of uh, project, integrated project, maybe Anthony can share with us like, you know, it's much more complicated to integrate different user within the same plot then of course. how to how do you uh, design or to work with different party architects engineers yeah. and from your experience uh Kappa, uh project efc uh, how 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 do you actually con reconcile some of this uh, issue because i think uh, having an integrated project uh what actually the objective the main objective or the, the priority that drives the project integration because I think there are different projects like residential, maybe more short term, you want to sell the project and, and to cover the cost and for office and retail, you probably keeping it for long term. You know, from the developer perspective, how to balance this, this kind of difference uh, 
kind of priority or objective. You know, trying to put them together and yet uh, without losing the main uh, uh, drive of this, you know, main vision of this, this integration. To me, I think the key thing is to try to consider things from the user perspective, what we call design thinking. So whether in, in the way you actually design your, the different components of your real estate, let's say between office and a condo, the condo on top of the, the mall, uh, another tower next to this office, it's always about the flow. Uh, so you need to look at the synergy in creating the, the synergized value. You want certain amount of vibrancy at the ground floor level. Uh, beyond the, what the user uh, activity generating use wanted, but you also want the correct look and feel. You want the correct bath for your retail, but you don't want it to be too chapalang. Uh, and then uh, the next thing would be your, your, your multiple tier MCSC, right? And then uh, what kind of right of way that one MCSC can give to the other uh, is usually a mutual granting of this. So you need to map out the whole thing uh, properly. Uh, by, by, okay, the condo MCSC owns this, the retail MCSC owns that, the office MCSC owns another one, right? So uh, then between the MCSC, you need to give each other, you need to draw your red line, etch out your red line, and then the mutual rights that we need to give one another. But that, that's only one part. Then you translate that part uh, back to your earlier question, how to balance, right? Obviously, it's about maximizing profit uh, and the flexibility to sell as and when, whenever we want. And then the mode of sale, the tax impact. So uh, parallel to this, which needs to fit in hand in glove, right, would be your tax structure, how you structure the different entities to hold the different uh, different parts. And uh, uh, that, that's quite tricky in Singapore because uh, our tax authorities are, are less accommodating. Uh, if you don't plan carefully, you can sometimes treat yourself, uh, sometimes uh, make yourself vulnerable to incidents of uh, paying stamp duty twice if you are not careful in the way you transfer. Sometimes along the way you find that hey, you have a good proposition, a new partner wants to come in, a new buyer wants to come in, but when you haven't met certain conditions, you were not able to sell parts of it or you don't structure an efficient entry, then your, your buyer could not structure a, an efficient uh, 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 entry, then he would end up paying more stamp duty, which will eat into your sale price anyway. Yeah. And, uh, Beyond this, actually, I mean, again, that is the, I won't call it the old world, that's more conventional way of doing things. In the past uh, four to five years, you see that starting from, first from condominiums, uh, we, we start to put in uh, apps, uh, uh, lifestyle apps into the condo, right? So you want to be able to, before you reach home, you can turn on your aircon to cool the place, turn on the lights. When you reach your condo, the gantry will leave up for you. Uh, the leaf, the, you know, they basically services to know that you're coming back or if you invite somebody, uh, the person can check in through your security property. So you would have read that now compared to let's say about three years ago uh, in, the, in the launching of a marketing uh, uh, project, uh, condo project, you, you don't have to consider your, your apps, your lifestyle apps, but now you have to. Uh, so, but the challenge we find is that there's also this conception of, this concept of uh, what, what is the real estate space value on your handphone, on your smartphone? So they've got so many apps, right? So different apps are compete for the space. So why should your, how do you convince your owners uh, to, to put in that app icon onto his phone that operates all this system? Uh, then you begin to think of what kind of value you want to add inside to your apps. How do you integrate between well, your residential app, and your commercial app, right? Uh, so you have a more under your condo block, so how do you integrate the app? So that how do you convince the, convince the office tenant to hey, use your app rather than their own uh, individual tenant app? So in a mixed development, we will see more of this kind of, of uh, things happening. Uh, sometimes you see as a conflict, sometimes brought together if they are synergized properly, the skill itself uh, will propel you to be able to bring uh, more partners along the way. So you bring your retailers, you bring your discount voucher that people can, can co combine together into your app, uh, that will help. But interestingly, I want to share uh, beyond that, right, more on, on a town planning basis. When people start to, uh, we had an interesting conversation with some other Chinese researcher that wanted to use AI uh, to help in their district operation, which is actually 
quite uh, of integrated development, which is actually very plausible. It sounds very good. Uh, but then again, when you have very large pieces of land, uh, especially it's mixed use, residential and commercial, then you realize that, uh, okay, uh, you come up with, with a, you come up with a master plan first, you submit to the government, then the government approve your master plan based on uh, your planning, right? And then in your first phase of uh, implementation of your project, you, you have uh, uh, different kind of AI features that collect information from your condo user, your mall tenants, your shoppers, your office users. Then you put all this data into your system of evaluation and it tells you a certain trend. Uh, that trend is supposed to tell you how to operate, how to plan for your phase three and phase four. But by then, your phase three and phase four may already have certain master planning parameters locked in already. So uh, then you have to go back to the government again to change the whole thing. So this is currently one of the, the issues which if you want to think about uh, applying AI, applying data collection and analytics to help you in your operation. And inevitably, your operation will tell you about some changes you need to make in your uh, further downstream master planning, then this, this can be one potential area of, of, uh, of uh, problem and challenges. Yeah, I think interesting to, to, to see some of the things. So now they the graduate to value add, they don't, need, don't necessarily have to, uh, they, they have to learn more than you know, evaluation, law, yeah. and development control. They also have to know how to understand a little bit of AI and, and also to integrate all these things. We also to play this, make some disclaimer. This, uh, the view actually doesn't represent the company or the university. So, so we also have recording this the session. So, uh, for Nigeria, uh, as we see, many company, new technology company, uh, enter the, uh, the the market, like Property Guru, 99.com, and are these company? Do you see them as a technology company or real company, or are the real estate company become more like technology, or technology company become real estate company? Do you see that? You know, because it uh, seems like they started as technology company, but they actually expand the 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 this market share quite rapidly. So maybe I hear from Naija before we open the question to the floor. Right, Naija. Okay, I think. Every every company, I mean, even the prop tech companies, I think they all will will, will tell people that we are a technology company, uh, okay. not a real estate company, and we are here to provide a solution um, where there's a market gap, and this solution will help to resolve. So if you look at um, in the sense like Hamlet, um, they are now also moving towards property listing. So to a certain extent, they are also a technology company. So um, the, the difference is this, um, is when for technology companies, they can do technically anything. Um, they can have the infrastructure to build apps or build solutions that can move into different fields very fast. So for instance, if we look at uh, Grab, um, they started off as a, a car sharing kind of platform. And then they evolve into uh, you know, food sharing. Um, to them, real estate, for instance, if they want to go, it will be pretty straightforward because they already have the data, they have the commuting data, they can actually do a lot of things out of it. Um, I think it's just whether they want or not. Then we also did hear about um, Razor. Razor also thinking about prop tech. Um, and there's a lot, uh, a lot of uh, examples of that. But one of the problems um, that we see, um, why they never really transcend that part, is that there is still a very, um, how do you put it, that when it comes to purchasing real estate, um, there's actually a lot of groundwork to do. You, you can't really say that, um, um, let's buy it off plan totally unless you really trust the agent. And that's why nowadays you see why agents now are trying to create that kind of branding and following because there's a lot of trust involved and they need to, you know, there's a lot of hand carrying around. So if they don't have that, there's a lot of things that, you know, they have to visit the ground, look at what is the surrounding, what is the environment because of the huge amount that, you know, they have to pay. Um, so going back, so, 
tech, technology companies, you realize that they find it a bit hard. And that is one reason why we see um, most of these technology companies end up, what they do is when they want to branch out to really property side, they start to get property professionals. Now, the, the case here for property guru is that um, they, are, they have first mover advantage, or I would say second mover. The first mover was actually iProperty, but um, the, the, they never managed to expand fast enough like Guru, and so Guru had a majority share. But even if we look at Property Guru, um, they only break even, I think, in 2018 or 2017. So that actually took a long time. Uh, if you look at it, it took a long time for them to even start generating revenue. And I think um, in the past, um, when we look at these tech companies, um, the problem is that, you know, as long as you are popular, you can actually get listed very fast. But I think after WeWorks um, and after a few uh, so-called these tech companies, um, when they come to listing, they found some issues with it. Um, then you realize a lot of emphasis is back to revenue, you know, uh, rather than you know, number of views or number of likes. And I think that is also what we see. We also see that shift. Now for property companies, uh, assisting consultancies, they are also rethinking the whole process, the whole, whole chain. Um, like I know of some consultancies, I will name names. Um, they, are think they already started, you know, when they talk about retail consultancy. They not only uh, provide you know, location type of uh, this, uh, uh, advice, but also advice on how they do the business. Uh, they make business consultancy together with real estate consultancy, the, really the whole chain of consultancy. And then now with data analytics, they also do it quite aggressively. So they buy up startups. We see like JRL, they buy startups uh, to develop technology uh, and you know, to use it as a springboard and to stay relevant. But even then, the cost is really high. So, so the the key thing here is that I think there will be kind of a blurring of lines when it comes to this, and there's actually more collaboration in, in terms of the tech side. So we may see like collaboration between a real estate company with a legal company, and together they do something in between. Um, so that, that is what I've seen in the, at least for, for the sector that now. Thanks, Major. <coughs> Seems like a lot of cross-disciplinary kind of works and, and, and also I think the university, probably some of you who have read the interview uh, on newspaper, interview with the provost, I think this is another trend uh, the university is moving toward, um, having more cross-disciplinary kind of uh, degree or courses. Uh, right. So, uh, and now I would like to open the questions, uh, give the next session to the floor. Okay, is there a, the real estate market cycle going downward or up and down cycle, what 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 is the take? You know, what is the advice? Who oh, Niger have been advising yeah. yes. many of these <laughs> buyers. So now he is not in, he's he's giving this is in not in this not in the capacity of his uh, research head and in the consultancy yeah. firm. Now he's yeah. So, you want to stick? Yeah, say yeah. something. Yeah, so I put my disclaimer again. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you if you earn money after my advice, um, okay, that's great. <laughs> but if you somehow lose money, uh, don't come and look for me. <laughs> 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 okay, but but to be honest, um, and that is actually a lot of uh investors. Um, they are. I mean, retail investors looking at real estate now. Um, but the problem is um, when you are looking for this kind of assets, um, you, everybody has that uh, connotation that prices you know, that you offer should be uh, 20 to 30%. So now buyers are actually pretty savvy, or I should say the investors are pretty savvy. They are all looking for what we call the distressed sales. That means sales that, you know, People are desperate to uh, sell off the project and then, or sell off the uh, development or units and then you, know, you hope for a 20 to 30% drop in price. Because technically that is the most ideal situation for retail investors. Um, but at this point in time, uh, distress sales, um, we don't see them coming out yet. 
um, because of the various measures the government have in place. So to answer your question, whether is it the right time? Um, I think the right time is when you see that the market, if we follow the market cycle, is that when the market sales volume is actually the lowest, then uh, is the right time. But the problem here is because of COVID-19, everything is a bit disrupted. And there's actually a lot of capital in the market. So um, that is actually, I think at this point in time, there's a lot of uncertainty. So I would say it's an up cycle, or more likely to be a down cycle, but um, we never know whether there's a V-shaped kind of recovery because of the amount of capital uh, in the market. And there's also a lot of um, a, a, a lot of interest in Singapore residential assets as a whole. Not only Singaporeans for Singaporeans, but overseas as well. Because Singapore, I think, has established a kind of a safe haven kind of a status. So we already see quite a fair bit of money, you know, uh, from different sources. Um, that, that, that is coming in. Um, so that is mainly anecdotal evidence um, that you know, foreign buyers are coming back. So I think um, at this point in time, uh, it will be very difficult for anyone um, to actually advise you whether this is the right time to come in. But if you have some asset in mind that you want to purchase, probably it's a good time to start looking at it uh, and then know where it is. Because when the market is uh, soft, it's also very difficult to find a product that you like or to want to invest in because the search time will be longer, um, partly because of the loss aversions sellers actually have. Uh, I think, you know, in Chinese word, when the crisis is so there's a flip side. One side is no way, way is risk, and the other side is opportunity. And we can see with this pandemic, actually, we actually cause a lot of. Uh, impact on real estate market. What do you see are the, some of the emerging opportunity and you know, what's our new opportunity for real estate, um, uh, whether they are employments or, you know, or the, 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 some opportunity that can arise out of this pandemic? I think the key thing that arises from this pandemic probably as we all know would be mm -hmm. number one is liquidity and number mm -hmm. two is uh, pressure, certain distress. Mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning, of March, April, you would have heard that uh, quite a few fund managers in US, in UK, has uh, suspended any kind of redemption. Uh, so they had no money, no liquidity to pay, uh, pay their, their, their investors, their, their, their subscribers, we call it. So uh, people wondering whether that would lead to uh, a lot of distress sales. So, but following soon after that, there was in every country, in, in most countries in the world, there were, there were a lot of pump timing, there was a lot of liquidity being uh, flooded into the market. So to some extent, uh, that has kind of uh, slowed the, the pressure uh, for the moment. Uh, we are not seeing uh, widespread distress sales coming on yet. Yeah. At the same time, even before that, we know prior to that, the, the markets were quite deep and wide as well. Uh, so Asian capital especially. So we think uh, it, it may probably come, depend on, I mean, as one, as, as a month pass, right, I think most of us are used to this notion that, okay, we probably can't expect a V-shaped recovery. So it's U-shaped, you know, how long is a U or worse U? Could it be an L-shaped situation for some time? Yeah. So that's made underwriting very difficult. And you can see even the read valuation uh, has a lot of qualification these days. Renter says occupancy and so on. No, no, not too much arrears and so on. So, I think uh, by and large, uh, there could be opportunities coming. I think, especially in the hospitality side. But thing is, as a, as an investment manager, how do you uh, how do you try to uh, justify your underwriting? How do you mitigate the risk uh, for hospitality product? Uh, it's still unclear yet how will travel take place in future, how will commerce take place in future. Uh, so uh, I think uh, it's, it's a bit similar as in the residential sector. Uh, there may come more and more situations where uh, property owner, fund manager may need to cover their position. They may need to 
ask for extension outline, extension in their credit. So there, there could be more opportunities coming, uh, especially in, in cities that are less, has got less debt in their real estate market. Thanks, uh, Adrian. Uh, given the current current situation, maybe you we really want to give one or two words or inspiration, motivation to our graduating student. Uh. You know, what are new opportunity for them in the job market? Uh, for 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 our side, uh, I think like like Dr. Lee has said, I'm also looking out for distress sales for me to uh, opportunity for us to to purchase uh, development sites. Uh. But uh, for, for our undergraduates, I only have uh, a few things to say. I, I suppose critically, you need to be really open about it. Uh, don't, don't just be purely focused about, you know, I just want to do valuation and only valuation. Uh, I, I just share with you, I am, I am the director of the company. But in the back of my car, I still have a safety helmet and uh, safety boots. I, yeah. we, we do take uh, opportunity to also go to site, uh, work uh, at the ground level, uh, take, on, take on different aspects of work because I think although we are a listed company, we, we do everything from A to Z. I am part of the, the the team that's working with the architect, the engineer, and the developers, and, and, and the M&E engineers to develop the scheme. Uh, we, we get all the approval. I'm also part of the marketing team who actually uh, uh, come up with the product. And, and also I'm part of the construction team that actually carry out the development. And not forgetting that we also do defecting down the road. So, so if you are really open to the idea of any aspect of work, uh, I, I think you have a lot of opportunity. Uh, it's, it's endless for that matter. Uh, you just need to open your, your mind to, to uh, opportunities. Thanks. Uh, there are two questions relating to the cost and the price. Huh? One of them, uh, talking about the, the, the construction migrant workers side, I mean the, the, the metri, I think. Yep. The, the impacts, you know, increasing construction costs mm. uh, and also project costs uh, in, in the short term and also the medium term. So, how would this being uh, would this cost increase in cost pass on to the buyers? Right. I think the second one also quite related is actually about uh, cost. On the on one hand, it's about cost. The second story is about pricing. So, a lot of. Uh, uh, Agents have been marketing about this capital appreciation kind of uh, 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 story. You know, capital appreciation is long term. Will COVID impact actually have any any immediate impacts on the pricing to go? And will this continue to increase in the short term? You know, uh, on this issue, the cost side and also the capital appreciation, will that will, will we see this? prices to continue to go up. On one hand, you know, you're going to have higher costs for developer. On the other hand, the capital appreciation, you know, the agent have been marketing on this, uh, this story of capital appreciation. If the price is going to continue to go up, are we going to see the price continue to rise rather than and, and going down because of the, the pandemic? On my side, uh, yeah. uh, maybe more on the local, local front, uh, our concern is, uh, of course, uh, the price point. Of course, we are always trying to have a point of difference from our competitors uh, as far as our product is concerned. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely not competing with the likes of the reflection and, and the, the projects in, within District 9, 10, 11. But wherever we have, uh, we are always looking at a price point where for the same price with our competitors, how different is our product. But at the end of the day, um, um, it is, it is uh, critical to us to be able to, uh, of course, as developers get a profit out of it, but to manage our costs. Uh, the biggest component is always land and, and construction, but uh, construction itself is not more than 20 to 30 percent so, so of our development costs. So at the end of the day, if you're talking about foreign workers, uh, uh, levy going up or the cost of construction has gone up. It is 
to my opinion, still a relatively small component. I, I don't see prices going up dramatically uh, uh, because of uh, foreign workers. I don't see it as a major component. Um, and having uh, done projects in Australia, they are able to, uh, because of high cost of manpower, able to introduce technology to uh, uh, reduce this cost, or this factor of cost for that matter. I think the, 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 the final thing I want to say is as far as prices are concerned, we are all looking at the five-year ABSD uh, looming over <laughs> our head more than anything else uh, as far as Agreed. pricing is concerned, whether we are able to sell or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Extended for six months. Do you think they're going to uh, extend for uh, that? Six months is not going to. Six months is not going to help at all. <laughs> yeah. That's why you want to ask a question. I wanted to ask Adrian. Uh, I was quite interested with your sharing of Premier Tower. Yep. Particularly, you mentioned that eighty percent of the buyers actually bought without visiting the development or even the city itself, Australia, right? So I just wanted to know how many, 80% or how many units and, and who are the profile of people who actually buy offline because I think given the COVID situation, uh, this is really an opportunity to develop this area because people always think that real estate, uh, you really need to feel and touch the product and the quantum is so big, right? So I'm just I'm just interested and curious. Uh, uh, how how does a person successfully market uh, real estate online without people actually seeing the the product itself? Thanks thanks Joseph for the question. Yeah. I, I suppose the the issue is we for Premier Tower we have about mm -hmm. close to eight hundred units. Uh, we have sold seven hundred odd units, and I recall eighty percent of them. At, I think at least eighty percent of them have been sold overseas. Uh, local buyers are few and far in between. Uh, average prices are hovering at about seven hundred thousand thereabouts. So, so as as you have rightly said, uh, we have managed to sell them primarily overseas without. Uh, uh, building a show flat in China or, or building a show flat in Indonesia or Malaysia or Singapore for that matter. Um, the, uh, I, I suppose most of our sales were done pre-COVID. Uh, it is out of necessity that these buyers are not coming over uh, uh, to Australia or to Melbourne that, that, that bought them. And uh, they, they were pretty fine with viewing videos, viewing images, um, having travel models, uh, uh, and, and, and I suppose the confidence of the agencies that were selling them. Uh, we, we kept to uh, more, uh, what would you call, renowned agents that had the confidence and not fly by night uh, to carry through these sales because it took us four years to build this tower. And at the end of the day, we have to handhold the buyer throughout the journey to say that, look, um, you know, we are at this stage and we are coming to completion soon and, and, and to, to keep you fairly updated with the project. So building that confidence is critical as well. Can I have a, ask a follow-up question? Uh, sure. You mentioned China, Indonesia, Malaysia. Mm -hmm. uh, Singaporeans are not in there. I mean, I, I wanted to ask, uh, would would this would Singaporeans be open to buying properties even in Singapore's project, right? Virtual, mm -hmm. do you think it will work or or you still need the show flat? Is it will I, I think tipping the scale would a show flat would do. Uh, okay. definitely will definitely do. But what I was saying is that um, there are about let's say I would think about fifty to eighty buyers from Singapore who did not make the trip to Melbourne. Yeah, and, and even if they were in Melbourne, I don't have a show flat in Melbourne to show it to them. Uh, it's, it's for them to feel the vibrancy of, of Melbourne, possibly. But uh, other than that, they, they took on the purchase quite confidently. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's two questions, two related questions uh, about this COVID impact changing the way of uh, 
the life, the, the living. <laughs> you know, people shop more during the COVID period. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot more delivery, you know, you order food online and so on. And also people work more. I think just now, Anthony mentioned about this, you know, work from home, how to create more space. So how would this, you know, uh, kind, of, kind of social distancing and then, and having to work from home and, and delivery, how would this actually change the design of residential developments? I think we are looking at, well, will the cost of residential project or residential developments increase with, by having to provide, for example, you know, how are you going to design the delivery to drone? You know, if, you, if, you, if more, more people shopping uh, online and the delivery had, be done, had to be done, so do you need to provide a special drone pack on, in the buildings or, or some delivery point or collection point and similarly for the working from home as well how are you going to uh, uh, optimize the design uh, on, two part, on the call side right uh, we can divide them into whether is it a capex or is it uh, usually it's a capex plus a opex so yeah. over time i think uh, but the good thing is usually such calls do not comprise a very big part as adrian mentioned just now your construction cost is usually that 20-25% of a project's total development cost. So this additional little fittings, little enablement, we call it to, to, uh, to help with uh, home delivery and so on. Uh, it is important, it's necessary, uh, but it usually won't, won't be a big cost to a developer. Uh, and usually uh, when you do that, right, it usually gives you one more uh, feature to market in your product. So you, you, you can use it to sell as well. So uh, in other words, it is a cost, a capex which has a corresponding value. So it's quite justifiable. Um, what, what people have done in, 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 is that they have worked out uh, arrangements with uh, the delivery services uh, for COVID, right? It's about contactless delivery. You'll find that different service providers, they try to work out a contactless delivery system. Uh, on the hardware side is, how do you enable your condo uh, to receive such delivery? Uh, in the usual delivery boxes you place in the basement to receive it. Uh, it's all automated uh, at base. Uh, the security is fine. So you don't have to see the delivery man. Uh, you can use your own disinfectant before you collect, before and after you collect the, the, the goods. So uh, that, that part is okay. Yeah, not, not too difficult. Yeah. I have a question. I want to hear some views from the private sectors, whether you have given some thoughts so far about this. Uh, uh, lease uh, decay issue, <laughs> big problem now could be a political hot potato also. But we're looking at the concern that uh, Singaporeans had recent years, couple of years, about HDB lease uh, getting uh, you know, beyond uh, uh, shorter than 50 years and so on. And then I look at uh, our neighbours, big neighbours like China and Indonesia, where typically they are residential lease also between 50 to 70 years and uh, they live happily with that. Um, although um, some government may have some different commitment at the end of the 50 or 70 years. But I'm just thinking aloud, is it possible that we have a scenario in Singapore, uh, maybe not so soon, but five, 10 years time, where either the government, most likely, or the private sector may take the lead in exploring this uh, new sector of the residential segment where you launch a totally new 60-year lease kind of housing, whether public housing or even residential housing, uh, which then typically will hopefully be cheaper because you're only selling a 60 years rather than 99-year lease. And whether private sector will find that a possibility and a very attractive, uh, profitable uh, proposal or not, if, you, if it's practical for you to go to the market and get some uh, land lease, which is you know, quite short, and then just top it up to 60 years and market it as a 60 years, totally new kind of a business segment in Singapore and whether the, uh, this market will take off. Just uh, wonder some thoughts from the private sectors. It is always based on demand supply and uh, no, demand not only from the occupation perspective but from the investment perspective, perspective also. So as with all things, usually when it starts, uh, the 60-year lease would price cheaper, uh, more affordable. But uh, if you compare a 99-year today uh, versus a, a freehold, right? Uh, the the premium, the price premium uh, or discount usually differ between times. In a very hot market, 
sometimes you almost don't feel it. But once the market is down, then the tenure difference becomes a big thing. So uh, my take is that yes, definitely uh, there will be a higher demand because primarily because of affordability. Uh, but then there are other, other downsides as well. Like the ease of financing, the ease of repayment, whether uh, CPF is usable to pay for uh, a shorter lease. Uh, because after you buy, 10 years later when you resell, right? So it depends on what kind of uh, uh, CPF uh, revision uh, are, are have been made. So, uh, and, and there, there are already uh, small little examples here and there. Uh, in the past, some, some years ago, Anak Bukit, Jalan Anak Bukit has some uh, pseudo retirement housing kind of concepts. Uh, those, once you can price it smaller, shorter, uh, in, in the buoyant market, it certainly uh, will be very effective. I think it will capture demand. But in a, in, in a, the more buoyant the market is, I'm afraid that the, the differential, the premium will, will get smaller and smaller. Yeah. And vice versa in a, in, a, in a poor market. So one has to be very careful uh, with those things. But from an occupation perspective, it, it can be perfectly yeah, usable. In Singapore, we don't have a, a PRS or built to, build to, to rent yet. Uh, so those can be a higher yielding uh, product. Uh, in China, in, in UK, there are a lot of such products already. So if it's uh, built for lease, right, it becomes easier uh, for developer, for uh, fund investor to, uh, to finance such, to invest in such product and, and derive a good returns out of it. Yeah. I'll just have the session by asking Nigel the last question. I think two, two actually participants asked this question about digitalization. So digitalization of the title, can we actually and expect more sales, a digital sale moving forward and, and will this digital conveyancing kind of uh, processes become uh, non moving forward? Nigel, you want to have a quick uh, spawn then we can wrap up the session? Yeah. Sure. Uh -huh. yeah. I think uh, SLA and then we uh, and the law society have been looking at mm. actually what we call the e-signature. So mm. I think the next step is actually to have the e-signature such that you know you can have the transaction done online and be recognized. Because um, now currently, even though you transact, you still need uh, to go through the, uh, the the signature and then it must be stamped and. All these things have to be done uh, because that was from the tradition of you know land conveyancing. So definitely, I think digital sales will probably be in the future. Uh, we will see a lot more once the government actually uh, approve the process of the e-signature. Yeah. Uh, we're coming to the end of the session. I would like to again thanks our three panelists, Adrian, Anthony, and Nigel. Uh, to close this session, I would. Uh, it's very heartening to, to hear the words. You know, there are a lot of emerging opportunity. So to our graduating students, uh, don't lose heart. You know, uh, keep work, uh, looking at for the new opportunity. There are a lot more uh, dynamic and, and more uh, uh, changes coming coming in the market. So there's a lot of opportunity if you can adapt to the change and, and, and optimize some of this opportunity. Uh, again, I would like to thank all of you all for your time and, and also all the participants for joining us. I uh, hope this session uh, will be a useful and fruitful one to share some of this experience. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, uh, all. Thank you. Thank you.